So I became interested in science at a very young age. In fact, I remember being so excited for nine o'clock to roll around. So my father and I could watch NOBA on PBS. I was so inspired by the, the big words they used and their profound pictures and their explanations that were so well crafted that even I could occasionally understand them. And it was, it was amazing to see all the things that we had learned. But what was even more amazing is realizing that there were so many mysteries left to solve, so many things we did not understand. And so this passion for science stayed with me my entire life. And um, I, I, was, I ended up getting my, my bachelor's degree in chemistry from Westminster College and then going to uh, Penn State University for graduate school. And I was always interested in renewable energy and efficient ways of producing that energy. In particular, the promise of the free and virtually inexhaustible amount of energy provided by the sun. After all, if the sun goes out, we have much, much bigger problems. And so in the back of my mind, I had always thought that our man-made systems and our artificial systems had pretty much solved everything, that there were really no mysteries left to crack, and it turned out that, that I was wrong. And so I ended up joining a lab that looked at exactly that, but from a slightly different perspective. So in our lab, one of our primary concerns is solar energy conversion, essentially turning light into energy that we can use. And we do this using natural materials. And you may be wondering why we're using natural materials. Well, it turns out that nature has spent the last few billion years solving the problems that we are currently plagued with. And clearly we have not had that much time to play around with these materials. So it, it makes sense to look at this. And it does this in a process that we all learned about in the fourth grade, photosynthesis. And this process is something that, that we know a great deal about, but we don't know everything. In fact, there are many mysteries that we still need to solve. And so if we want to create an efficient and effective way to harvest and convert light energy, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Nature has given us a great example right in front of us. And so what I mean by that is that you can think of, say, a solar panel and a leaf as doing roughly similar jobs. So a solar panel converts light into energy in the form of electricity, whereas a leaf converts light into energy or into chemical energy or what me, we may better know as food. And it's amazing to think that in the grand scheme of, of life and death and, and what eats what, the only new input for eons has been sunlight. That's it. And so when you sit down to eat a salad, it's, it's a little off-putting to think that you're not actually eating the salad. What you're eating is the sunlight it took to make that salad, the energy that is now in those chemical bonds. And this is fascinating. Energy, or, uh, and nature has been able to do this efficiently for a long period of time, and it's something that we are still struggling to do. And to expand on that a little bit, here we have the output of the sun, the amount of light that the sun, that sun spits out at us. And so in yellow, we have what hits the atmosphere of the Earth. And in orange, we have what hits the surface of the Earth, essentially what energy we have to work with. And so on the left side of the graph is where the really high energy light is. And as you move to the right, it tapers off into the low energy. And if we look at, say, one of our, our uh, artificial systems, let's say a, a titanium dioxide solar cell, this can only use a sliver, a sliver of the high energy light that hits the Earth's surface. And yes, we can expand this, but doing so requires often really expensive and rare materials. And so, if we look at what nature can use, nature can use every wavelength of visible light that there is. And coincidentally, it is the maximum output of the sun. And it does this using literally dirt sheet materials. If you pick up a handful of dirt, odds are you have all the material you need to produce one of these natural and efficient solar cells. And so if we want to 
to understand how nature can do this, we have to take a journey into a leaf. And so if we zoom in a little bit, we'll stumble across what are known as the thylakoid membranes. And these you can think of as essentially the, the factory where all the machinery is kept. And if we zoom in a bit farther, we'll see a bunch of really tightly packed proteins. And these proteins are essentially the machinery. They do the work. And in our lab in particular, we focus on a protein known as photosystem one. And this can actually be seen as, as something of a, of a model system. It is able to harvest light energy with remarkable efficiency and really minimal losses. And so to study this, we might be able to unlock some of the secrets as to how nature can do what it does so well. And so you might notice immediately that this, this protein is, is very complicated with a bunch of pieces stuck together to it. So to simplify things down a bit, we'll look at just three pieces, the three pieces that contain most of the important stuff. And now the first goal of this protein is to harvest light energy. And what I mean by that is to gather all this energy, all this light that it sees, and move it into one place so it can be used. And it does this in a really unique way. So this protein is, is jam-packed full of about 100 chlorophyll molecules. And these molecules serve to function somewhat like a satellite dish. So in a satellite dish, wherever light hits on the dish, it is immediately reflected to the focal point. And so you don't need to hit a very small wire to get a signal. You can hit a very wide area. And so this is exactly how nature, how nature works. So when light excites one of these molecules, these, these chlorophyll molecules are arranged so close together that the energy can transfer immediately from one to the next to the next. And in fact, it'll zoom all around the protein. And it will do this until it reaches what's known as the trap. And as the name implies, the energy is now trapped and it can't go anywhere. And this whole process takes on the order of femtoseconds. To put that into perspective, a millionth of a billionth of a second, really, really fast. And so now we have all this energy in one place and we need to turn it into something useful and get it out so that the cell can do something with it. And so it turns out that this energy takes the form of what's known as an excited electron. And now it is the goal of this protein to help this electron make what really is an epic journey from one side of the protein to the other. And, and I say epic, even though it may not seem so, I mean, it only has to go about 10 nanometers or three 10 millionths of an inch uh, to what us may seem like a, a, a very small distance. To this electron, it is, it is a vast space. And to put that in perspective, to jump directly from one side to the other, based on what we now know about, uh, about how fast electrons move, this would take a really, really, really long time. Longer, in fact, than the lifetime of the universe. And so this is a real problem. Uh, this is a, a serious issue that nature has to address. And so imagine you're a construction worker and you are building a skyscraper, a very tall skyscraper, and you're standing on the sidewalk and you're holding the last brick. And this brick has to go to the very top of the building. And so you might think, well, maybe I'll just throw it to the top. Maybe I'll just stand on the sidewalk and keep throwing it until I get the right height and the right position, and then the, the, the skyscraper will be finished. The problem is that might take a really long time. So instead what you might do is hand the brick off to someone on the first floor, who then hands it to someone on the second floor, who hands it to someone on the third floor, and so on. And this is exactly how nature solves this problem. So nature puts in a series of, of, of baby steps, of, of, of um, small molecules that serve to allow the electron to move through. And nature has fine-tuned these things so well by adjusting both the distance, making sure that they are never too far apart, and the energy, so that one is always lower, or the, the next one is always lower in energy than the previous one. And in doing so, nature ensures that this electron will move always through the chain and will always move forward. And so if we compare how long this takes, this process takes about one microsecond, a hundred thousand times faster 
than the blink of an eye and considerably faster than the lifetime of the universe. And so the journey's not over yet. Now what happens is that we have the electron sitting at the end of this chain. Another protein will come in, dock, pick it up, and whisk it away. And at this point, it can go do chemistry. It can go turn carbon dioxide into food. And when you think about it, this is really amazing. What is the only thing that we added to the system? It was light. Light initiated this entire process. Sunlight that we get all the time, every day, started this entire process. And so we, in our lab, we thought, you know, what if we could bring the chemistry closer to the protein? Instead of having it happen in some nebulous region, what if we brought it right next to the protein? What could we accomplish and what could we learn about this system? And so we have taken this protein out of the cell and we've modified it a little bit. So we've been able to add what's known as a molecular wire, essentially a, a tether, a tether that can hold two things close together. And to the other end of this tether, we add a catalyst. And so you can think of a catalyst as essentially something that does the chemistry. So we're bringing the chemistry really close to the protein. And when we do this, what we find is that when we hit this thing with light, the electron can move through the chain onto the catalyst and do some really neat chemistry. And in this case, using light to produce hydrogen gas, a promising and clean, or a clean burning fuel source. And this has been work that's been done for a long time in, in many different labs and in many different ways. And so, but they all have one thing in common. And that is that we're always getting this electron from the end of the chain. And if you remember, I had said that each molecule is slightly lower in energy than the previous one. One consequence of this is that by the time you get to the end, you've lost quite a bit of energy. And in fact, nature in this system loses about half of its energy by the time it gets to the end. So I wanted to address this. I mean, why is nature okay with this? Why is it okay with losing energy as it goes along? Why wouldn't you get as much out of the system as you could? And so I was able, oh, so imagine, to put this into perspective, you need to knock down this building and you conveniently have a giant hill with a very large ball on top of it. Now, if you start rolling this ball down the hill from the top, by the time it reaches the bottom, it'll be rolling really quickly and you can just demolish this building. And now imagine if you start rolling this ball from pretty close to the bottom, it's not gonna be going really fast at all and you probably won't even hurt the building if you, if you even get there. And of course, there's somewhere in the middle where if you let go, it'll be rolling quick enough, maybe enough to, to do some damage to the building, but, but who knows. And so essentially what nature's doing is, is starting the ball farther down the hill. And so why doesn't it drag the ball to the top of the hill? What, what is, what's stopping it from doing this? And what does it take to make that happen? What can we figure out from this? And so I was able to essentially add this tether to one of the interior molecules of this protein, essentially getting it at a really high energy state. And, and we were able to attach, again, another catalyst to the system so we could study it. And so we learned some really interesting things when we did this. So imagine you are an electron. You're sitting on this molecule. You have two options available to you. You can go forward, the route that nature has intended, or you can go out this brand new route that we've just introduced. And it turns out, to our dismay, in fact, that it never goes out to the catalyst. 100% of the time, it goes forward. And this is by design, right? Nature has spent a long time making sure that that route is the fastest possible. And so we thought, okay, well, what happens once it gets to the end? And it turns out that it goes all the way to the end and it'll sit there and it'll sit there and it'll sit there and it'll function as if there is nothing there to take it. I mean, we have this thing ready to do some work and it's pretending like it's not there. And so what'll happen is after a certain amount of time, it'll just creep back through the chain and go back home, no problem. And so this was a, a real issue. I mean, how are we gonna get the energy out to this thing to get some really a, a high amount of energy to this catalyst? And so we had an idea. 
What if we could park this electron? What if we could strand it? And so we found that if we added another electron into the system and filled the gap where it was going to go, this is now parked. It is stranded, its uh, retreat is cut off, and it can't go anywhere. And so now it has enough time to go through this relatively slow route out to the catalyst and do, again, some fun chemistry. And again, producing hydrogen gas. And this was a really, really neat find. So this system may not be as efficient as others that are out there, but it's what we can learn from this that is truly amazing. So we now have a better understanding as to why nature doesn't drag this ball to the top of the hill. After all, it doesn't need to. Why would you drag the ball to the top of the hill if you could let go and destroy that building from the middle? And this is something, that parking electrons is something that we may be able to, to adapt and put into our artificial systems to help make them much more viable. And this is, this is how it goes with science. We don't know where this work is going to go, but that's not the point. So the men and women who dedicate their lives to science, studying to what an outside observer may seem like some niche issue and in some obscure system on some esoteric subject. When they study these things, they add what are seemingly small droplets into our total pool of understanding. But it's the culmination of these droplets, of the data and information that contributes to the rising tide of scientific progress. The very thing that got us where we are today and will continue to raise our society and our species to greater and greater heights. Thank you.